Welcome to Weapons and Warfare, where if you ask us, we think there's a lot to offer in this week's episode. In our debrief, we step inside a device called the Mind Gym to see how one artist's idea turned into something the Air Force wants to help airmen all over the world hone their mental fitness. Our weapon of the week takes its name from ancient Greece. However, it's anything but history for troops taking on an armored foe. And in our comms check, we set the record straight on drones in the Red Sea and the war in Ukraine. But first, some headlines you may have missed. Big news from the Army, as the branch announces a plan to trim some 32,000 jobs from its ranks over the next five years, including 3,000 positions from their special operations units. The cuts come as the Army looks to navigate recruiting struggles and a Congress that's been unable to pass a budget or find a way to fund aid to Ukraine or Israel or Taiwan. The cuts are also a way to make room for about 7,500 new positions in areas of need, like the Mobile Short Range Air Defense Program and Multi-Domain Task Forces. As for the jobs on the chopping block, they fall in line with the DOD's shift to focusing on bigger theaters of war and reducing the need for people in counterterrorism and counterinsurgency units. Regarding the special ops cuts, those will come from areas like print media and psychological operations. The term narcosub probably isn't one you would associate with the modern American military, but at least one officer in the Marine Corps isn't shying away from the term. The Marines are planning to test an autonomous low-profile vessel during this month's Project Convergence capstone. This is basically a narcosub. We copied the drug runners down south, and this thing is a uh, form-fit function to carry two Navy strike missiles and resupply. Despite the catchy nickname, the prototype is a logistics vessel, so it's a potentially stealthy way to get supplies to troops that may be operating in hard-to-reach places, called austere locations. There's definitely a little if you can't beat them, join them philosophy going on here as narco boats are historically difficult for U.S. drug enforcement agencies to track and stop. And finally, a scene that looks like it might have been straight out of Hollywood, but instead was inspired by the history books. Vail, Colorado is normally home to ski bums and snowboarders, if they can afford lift tickets, that is. But the town recently hosted the Legacy Days Ski Trooper Cup. Soldiers from the Army's 10th Mountain Division hit the slopes in some friendly competition that pays homage to the original ski troopers of the World War II era. The competition consisted of 150 pull-ups total as a team, and then from there we skinned up the mountain just behind me, which was a uh, grueling in and of itself. Uh, we skinned across the ridge, uh, came to a rock face, rappelled down, threw our skis back on. We then solemn skied down some uh, obstacles. This year's event marked the 79th anniversary of the Battle of Riva Ridge. In 1945, members of the 10th Mountain Division conducted a surprise attack on the Germans and were able to break through the Nazis' front line in Italy, which became a turning point during the war. When you hear the name Mind Gym, what do you think of? For me, I sort of just imagined a cartoon brain pumping iron. But for the folks at a growing startup in Denver, Colorado, and the U.S. Air Force, it's all about bringing mental fitness on par with physical fitness. Nestled in amongst the massive displays from defense contractors at this year's AFA Warfare Symposium was a rather nondescript 7-foot by 7-foot box. At least nondescript on the outside, because it's on the inside where this box really stands out. It's going to be dark, it's going to be some lights, some sounds. Towards the end you might find a sensation of floating. It's just five minutes. I'll see you on the other side. This is the Mind Gym from Lumina. It's a sensory experience that, according to its creators, can help its users work on their mental health. It allows you a breath into yourself and the ability to think way deeper than all this stuff in our standard reality consciousness and start to very quickly interact with our subconscious. The things that come to uh, a person's mind visually because the brain when not stimulated is trying to stimulate trying to make up things trying to fill in the blanks and so in a lot of darkness calm you can see 
the person that you really need to actually have a conversation with. You can see yourself, you can see your kid, you can see perspective shift, where it's like, man, everything in my life is so focused on X. Like, is that really the true meaning? Is that what I should be putting my heart and mind into? Admittedly, that's a lot for someone to wrap their mind around, which is why the folks at Lumina say trying is believing. You know, we have a phrase it's called like opening the door for somebody, which I got to do with you. You see your, your reaction when you got to experience it. And I've seen everything from, you know, some sleepy faces to some really joyful faces to some people with tears in their eyes. Um, everywhere from, you know, this helped me manage my stress to this helped me feel more connected to my God. It's like a whole range of reactions. But that's where Mind Gym is now. To get here, the people behind the project needed the right partner. And that's where the Air Force comes in. Lumina was able to take part in an incubator program called Small Business Innovation Research, or SIBR for short. SIBR essentially gave them the funding to develop their product into something that had tangible benefits for the men and women serving in today's Air Force. We started working on how to create a user interface that was intuitive, a self-serve kiosk system, um, and ultimately could collect, analyze, and give results on, at, the, at, at first, the bio data. So heart rate, heart rate variability, and respiration rate with a target of how do we take these really stressed out folks and just reduce their heart rate. And so that was the initial, what we launched into. The early results were positive enough. Lumina had a new problem. They needed to grow at a rate that worked for them and the Air Force. Enter Pam Glick, who not only saw the company's potential, but also knew the best way to develop it. We didn't really have a product that could be mass distributed yet. We really needed to scale it um, to be able to deliver it with a quality that we wanted to have. So when I first came in, I kind of pivoted the company to let's um, raise money, uh, invest in the tech, both the physical uh, uh, composition of the box as well as the software used to support it. Once they got the mind gym where it needed to be, things for the company really took off. We were fortunate to get it into seven of the, ma the nine major commands of the Air Force, um, which we felt really great about. Um, and now that we've got it scaled, we're looking to expand it um, within each of those bases. There are now mine gyms at almost a dozen Air Force installations from Hawaii to Turkey, and there are plans to add more very soon. The man taking the program to each new base estimates he spent 400 to 500 hours in the mind gym on his own. For him, it's more than a job. I just want to put as many people and faces inside of this thing to see what they can do. And I imagine eventually we'll be in professional sports. We're going into commercial aviation next. Um, I think we'll be in clinics, you know, airports, gyms. While we were at the AFA's Warfare Symposium in Colorado this year, I had the chance to experience the mind gym briefly, and it really was an amazing visual and auditory experience that will probably end up helping a lot of people if Lumina continues to expand. Time now for arguably our most popular segment, the Weapon of the Week. And before I start, let me just say we know this week's entry is not a new weapon, folks, but it is one of the most sought after. Okay. So for fans of ancient Greece and track and field, oh, she's done it! What a huge throw for Carol Winger! The javelin throw may be one of your favorite pastimes. Super producer for Weapons and Warfare, Brett Baker, found out it wasn't actually an Olympic game in Greece until 708 BC, though. Fast forward a few thousand years, and javelins are very different. In 1996, the name was given to a new piece of technology. That would be the FGM-148 Javelin, or the Advanced Anti-Tank Weapon System. In the simplest terms, it eats tanks for breakfast, but it's also been known to take out a boat from time to time. The Javelin started field testing almost three decades ago. It was designed by Texas Instruments. That's right, the calculator folks. And Martin and Marietta, now known as Raytheon slash RTX and Lockheed Martin. 
The Javelin made its combat debut in 2003 during the Second Gulf War. It gained a renewed level of notoriety recently during the Ukraine War. That's because it's really good at killing tanks, specifically by employing a top attack, hitting the tanks from above where they're most vulnerable. So what makes them so devastating? Called a fire and forget missile, the operator is able to simply sight the target, lock on, and send it, as they say. The automatic self-guidance system takes over and deals death from above. Javelins are actually really effective, especially in, um, in the battlefield, um, especially in our profession, whether it be light unit or you mechanize, uh, we're gonna have to carry that and we're gonna come up against some enemies that are gonna have heavy, heavy uh, equipment and that javelin is gonna basically just overturn that fight. Equipped with an infrared seeker and armed with two shaped charges, the first charge detonates any reactive armor while the second pierces the base layer. That lethality made them especially useful to Ukrainian armed forces facing a seemingly endless parade of Russian tanks and armored vehicles in the early days of the war. And just to give you an idea of how effective javelins were, an article from March of 2022 from World News reported of the first 300 javelins fired by Ukrainian troops, 280 tanks were knocked out of commission. Javelins have multiple firing modes too, and can be used against a wide array of targets, not just tanks. Buildings and other fixed structures are well within their wheelhouse. About two dozen countries currently use javelins. Another seven hope to add them to their inventory soon. All right, folks, it's time for Comps Check. It's one of my favorite parts of the show. It's our kind of opportunity to peruse these social media channels, look at our email inbox and see if there's any comments, questions, concerns that you have that we need to address. Also a chance for us to update you on stories that we have reported on previously when those updates don't really fit anywhere else in the show. If you have a comment, question, or concern that you would like us to see, uh, you can do so by leaving a comment in the uh, feeds uh, below in the comment section. You can also send us an email to weaponsandwarfare, all spelled out, weaponsandwarfare at san.com. Let's go ahead and get started. The first comms check comes to us on a story that I had done kind of about the two year uh, anniversary for the war in Ukraine and how it's, uh, it has changed the world and uh, this next year of fighting is, is shaping up to change the world again. Uh, the comment comes to us from Tracy, uh, Tracy Ave, Tracy Av, uh, not quite sure. Uh, but Tracy says, Zelensky should be jailed for letting the US and UK use his people for a proxy war. But I guess he don't care as long as the cash don't stop coming through the back door, frowny face. So Tracy, there is just so much here uh, that I want to unpack. I'm gonna try to do it quickly, but I'm gonna take each one of your uh, uh, points kind of point by point. So first of all, Zelensky should be jailed. Who's gonna jail him? Who's gonna jail him? The International Criminal Court, maybe? Uh, Zelensky has traveled to many member nations of the International Criminal Court. No one arrested him. However, on the other side of that coin, if Vladimir Putin travels to many of those same countries, he will be arrested because he is wanted as a war criminal right now by The Hague. And so who's gonna arrest Zelensky? No one's gonna arrest Zelensky right now. Um, your next point, he should be jailed, uh, or excuse me, uh, for letting the US and UK use his people in a proxy war. You're, you're implying that, um, you know, Zelensky is being forced into this situation by the United States and by Great Britain. Uh, again, wrong. If anybody is forcing Ukraine into the situation, Tracy, it's the Russians. It's Vladimir Putin. Who attacked two years ago? Who attacked? Russia attacked. In 2014, who started annexing eastern parts of a sovereign nation? Russia did that, not Ukraine. Uh, if you want to make an argument that the war in Ukraine is a proxy war between the, the U.S. and China or NATO and Russia or U.S., NATO and China and Russia all together, then fine. Okay, I, I can see that argument being made. But to say that Zelensky and the Ukrainian people were forced by the United States and the U.K. into this war is just, is just patently false, just on its face false. 
uh, moving on. Uh, I don't, I guess he don't care as long as the cash don't stop coming through the back door. Yes, the United States has sent over billions of dollars in, in aid and equipment uh, to Ukraine, most of that being actual hard supplies or training or ammunition or vehicles, weapon systems, that sort of thing. It's not actually like the United States is just, you know, writing a check to cash for billions and saying, here he goes, Zelensky, have fun. Uh, that's not the way it's happening. In fact, the United States actually has auditors on the ground uh, in Ukraine making sure that the stuff that we have sent and, and potentially will send in the future goes to where it needs to go. Uh, they have found some, some issues with that, some discrepancies, but the Ukrainians are trying to make good on that. That's why the Department of Defense, the Ministry of Defense in Ukraine, has seen, and the Ukrainian Armed Forces, have seen um, so many officer turnovers in the last couple of years because the, the Zelensky administration is trying to root out corruption within its ranks. Um, all, now, that being said, Tracy, still the vast majority of of, of aid being sent to Ukraine is not actually hard, hard cash. And what money is being spent, most of it will actually be spent here in the United States. Um, and Tracy, just one last quick little point. You say money in the back door. Uh, your public profile on, on TikTok, where this comment came from, shows that you're in Tennessee. Uh, some of the money that Congress is sitting on, the aid money that Congress is sitting on right now, the billions, some of that money is going to be spent in your state of Tennessee, potentially, uh, because the military systems group, which is headquartered in Tennessee, makes brackets and all kinds of different things for military vehicles like the HIMARS, which is a mobile launcher, which is in heavy use right now in Ukraine, and which a lot of uh, people, out, countries outside of Ukraine want to buy because it's so effective. So by by saying that the money is backdoor to to Zelensky and by being against uh, the Ukrainian aid, Tracy, you might actually be against your neighbor across the street uh, getting some work to be able to feed their family. So just think about that. Just just ponder on that for a little bit, and hopefully that helps answer some of your questions. Um, no one's going to arrest Zelensky. The U.S. and U.K. didn't force uh, uh, Ukraine into a proxy war. And there's no money coming in the back door. Most of that money is being spent here domestically to replenish the stocks that we have sent over to Ukraine. All right, real quick on our next comms check because I rambled admittedly in the last one. This is on a story about Houthi missiles in the Red Sea, Houthi drones in the Red Sea, and the U.S. effort to stop those attacks. Now, we had done a story about a captain in the U.S. Marine Corps, Captain Earl Earhart. Hey, there he is. Uh, who was credited with possibly being the next uh, ace pilot, the first ace pilot that the U.S. has had since the Vietnam War. Uh, for fans of, of that sort of thing, of, of pilots in their element doing what they do uh, and doing it to a high level, um, that was a pretty exciting story. However, it turns out the story might not have actually happened. And by might not, I mean probably didn't. So here's where it all went wrong. Uh, the story started on the USS Bataan. Uh, this is it right here. It's where Captain Earl Earhart and his Harrier jet uh, operate. Um, yes, in the Red Sea, Arabian Sea, in, in that theater of warfare. Uh, and there is a BBC reporter who was on the ship, uh, which is great access. I would love to have that. USS Bataan. If you have an opening, let me know. Anyway, uh, so BBC reporter on the ship goes to command and asks them about the drones and the missiles and the interceptions. And the command tells them, yeah, I mean, yes, the U.S. Navy and Marines and Air Force and, you know, the DOD is participating in that. But the Bataan, not so much. Uh, the BBC reporter apparently wanted to have a story, wrote any way that, you, uh, that the captain, Earl Earhart, had in fact shot down seven uh, Houthi drones when it was not a true story. The Navy has since gone to the BBC and asked them to correct the reporting. As of this recording of this segment, the BBC has not done so yet. But we here at Weapons and Warfare want to let you know that this story was inaccurate. We reported it as true. We are now correcting the record and saying it wasn't true. We relied on the BBC, like so many others did, for factual reporting, and we were let down. So, 
a little bit of egg on our face. Hopefully now that's cleared up. Uh, but certainly another opportunity for the BBC to just try not to suck so much next time, man. Really? I mean, if they tell you it's not a story, don't write up, don't make up stuff trying to make it a story. That doesn't help anybody. Uh, so, all right, that's it. I'm done. That's comms check for this week. All opinions expressed in this segment are solely the opinions of the contributors. All right, folks, we are nearing the finish line for this week's episode. As we round that final turn, I want to wrap things up talking about NATO, or the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. It started in 1949, when the United States, Canada, and a host of nations in Western Europe joined together to stop the spread of communism, which is another way of saying the U.S. agreed to keep the Soviet Union in check with our nukes, while the rest of Europe got its feet underneath it again after World War II. NATO was the first peacetime military agreement the U.S. joined outside of the Western Hemisphere, because the leaders of the day knew it was the best way to prevent an all-out nuclear war with the Soviet Union. As part of my job, I talk to a lot of people, some in the military, some who used to be in the military, and others who are experts in national defense and security. This past week, I asked one of them, of all the things going on in the world right now, the war in Ukraine, the war in Gaza, the potential Russia might try and put nuclear weapons in space, of all of those things, what keeps them up at night? The answer surprised me a little bit. They said the dissolution of NATO, specifically the dissolution of the alliance because the United States would let it happen. Now, on one hand, NATO has never been stronger. Sweden just received approval to become the 32nd member country and is the most well-armed new member to join the alliance in decades. Seriously, Sweden can throw down. On the other hand, American leadership in NATO is waffling. President Biden seems content letting the UK, France, Germany, and Turkey pretty much run the show right now. And if Donald Trump returns to the White House next year, who knows if he actually means it when he says things like Russia should attack NATO members that aren't paying their fair share, which is also just a weird thing to say from a factual standpoint because each nation is allowed to decide how much it wants to contribute to its own national defense. But that sort of rhetoric is contributing to a growing contingent of the American voting populace who believe the U.S. should just drop out of NATO because it's not like we get anything back for our money anyway, right? Here's the thing though, NATO was never about money. It's about safety through alliances. Member countries are encouraged to spend around 2% of their GDP on defense, yes, but the real value in NATO is the relationships between countries, like-minded nations joining together to stop common aggressors. If those like-minded nations have big militaries, great. If they let allied militaries set up bases within their boundaries in order to provide advanced positions if a war breaks out, that's good too. So much of U.S. defense strategy centers on the concept of keeping the fight over there, wherever there is. And to keep the fight over there, we need friends over there. But here is where we are going to have to leave it for the week. As a reminder, if you want to let us know how you feel about any of the stories you hear on Weapons and Warfare, you can do so by posting in the comments section of our social media feeds. You can also send us an email to weaponsandwarfare at san.com. Again, that's weaponsandwarfare, all spelled out, at san.com. For senior producer Brett Baker, video editor Brian Spencer, and graphics designer Dakota Patillo, I'm Ryan Robertson with Weapons and Warfare, signing off. Thank <laughs> you.